this is a short video called Tracking the Pup. And it's all about the star Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the night sky. You can see the little star map over to the right there showing Sirius as the brightest star in Canis Major, the big dog. And it's just to the bottom left hand corner of Orion. Now Sirius is the brightest star in the sky apart from the sun, not because it's especially powerful but because it's one of the sun's near neighbours. It's only 8.6 light years away and it is gradually approaching us uh, and increasingly uh, getting brighter as it does so but it's uh, going to be a very long time uh, in making any real difference. It's about twice the mass of the sun, 2.1 times, something like that, but the nature of stars is that the more massive they are, the more power they put out in a uh, much more than linearly proportional manner. So it's two and a bit times the mass, but it's 25 times the power output. And the temperature of our sun is 5,800 degrees. And here Sirius is nearly double. It's at uh, just under 10,000 degrees Kelvin. So it's a white hot star and it's quite young, only two to three hundred million years old. Now in 1718, Sir Edmund Halley, he of comet fame, noticed that Sirius and a couple of other stars, Aldebaran, Arcturus, were all moving across the sky relative to the far distant background of stars that are so far away that we can't tell anything about their movement. And of course, being nearby, that tends to make that easier. And he noticed that Sirius had moved by half a degree. That's about the same size as the full moon appears on the sky in 1800 years of observational data that he was looking at. A hundred or so years later, Friedrich Bessel looked at the motion of Sirius, this proper motion across the sky compared to the background stars and plotted it on this chart here, showing that it was wobbling backwards and forwards. And he realized that this must be because it had a companion that was orbiting around it. And in fact, a large companion, so massive that they were orbiting their common center of mass. And he could figure out from the length of the wobbles that the period was 50 years. Now to make a star like Sirius wobble as much as it was doing, this meant that the companion would really need to be quite massive indeed. And so he wanted to know why it was not possible to see it, why it had not been observed. Now just a few years later in 1862, Alvin Clark, the famous telescope maker, were testing what was then the largest telescope in the world at Dearborn in Chicago the 18.5 inch refracting telescope shown there in the, the side picture. So um, this was being used and they looked at Sirius as a nice test target. I often do that when I'm doing observing as well. And he spotted a faint companion, just visible uh, around about magnitude 8.4, which makes it 10 magnitudes less than the main star. The main star comes in at a magnitude of negative 1.45. Uh, so this uh, little companion is now called Sirius B. And here's a picture of Sirius B next to the main star. The main star's glowing white hot there, imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can just pick out the little tiny companion there. As I say, 10 magnitudes fainter, that corresponds to a factor of 10,000 less in brightness. And indeed, we've been able now to follow the orbits of Sirius and Sirius B, and they orbit around their common center of mass. It's uh, very useful when you can track a, a companion orbiting a, an object, because you can use Kepler's laws of planetary motion even though they're both stars, the laws are the same, it's just the laws of gravity. And you can calculate the masses of the two very precisely. So we know that Sirius A, the bright star, is 2.1 solar masses, 
and the faint companion star is just under one at 0.98. So it's rather curious that Sirius B is 98% of the mass of the Sun, but it's actually putting out 500 times less power. And uh, as I said, a magnitude of 8.4, fairly faint. Not visible to the naked eye, even if Sirius wasn't there. The uh, faintest star that the naked eye can see is magnitude 6. But when they looked at the spectrum of it and studied it with other telescopes, they worked out that the temperature of this little star was 25,000 degrees Kelvin. Very hot indeed. And so hot that it's actually able to give off quite a lot of x-rays. The picture on the right is an x-ray picture. You can see that the main star is giving off some x-rays, but the difference in brightness between the main star and the small companion Sirius B is much less. And so the, the christened these types of stars, these rather unusual stars, white dwarf stars. They're obviously very small and they appear basically white it to the eye. Now what we know about them is that they are super dense. They pack something like the mass of the Sun, in the case of Sirius B, 0.98 solar masses, into a radius about the same size as the Earth, or even a little bit smaller. And uh, that's quite curious because a million Earths would be needed to fill the volume of the Sun. So on average, the white dwarfs are a million times more dense than the planet Earth is. And so you can work out that a sugar cube would weigh a ton. So the history of the Sirius system, Sirius A and Sirius B, is that they were both formed roughly 250 million years ago, and that Sirius A started as a 2.1 solar mass star, and it remains so. It's blue-white main sequence star, which means it's fusing the element hydrogen, the simplest element, into helium inside its core with an outer temperature about 10,000 degrees Kelvin, and it'll probably continue doing that for another 750 million years before the core hydrogen will start to become exhausted. But Sirius B was probably born as the much heavier star of the two at about five solar masses. It burned through that very quickly as a hot blue star with an outer temperature of between 15 and 20,000 degrees. And this is because the more massive a star is, albeit it has more fuel, it burns that fuel disproportionately faster. And so after only 100 million years, Sirius B ran out of hydrogen in the core. What then follows is a rearrangement and the uh, star swells up to become a red giant and then moves on and starts fusing hyd uh, helium in the core to carbon and even to oxygen. But around about 120 million years ago, we think, that process came to a stop, wasn't massive enough to do any more fusion, taking the carbon and oxygen on to the next uh, set of elements, which would be uh, neon and magnesium in the fusion chain, needed to probably have a mass of eight solar masses in order to generate the temperatures necessary for that step. And so the star died, puffed off its outer atmosphere, creating what's called a planetary nebula, an expanding smoke ring, and probably blew away about four of the five solar masses in the process, leaving that one solar mass ash pile of carbon and oxygen which is the dead nuclear core, the white dwarf star that we see today. Now, if you could cast your mind back, and perhaps the age of the dinosaurs, 65 million years or so ago, perhaps longer, wouldn't it have been amazing to see just how bright Sirius would have been? Sirius B would have far outshone even Sirius A at that time. It would have been a hugely bright uh, star in the sky. 
then it would have become a red giant and with that increase in size comes an increase in power output and it would have been even brighter so it must have been truly awesome sight in the sky back uh, 100 million 200 million years ago but there is a slight controversy about this because only in the year AD 140 Ptolemy recorded the colors of the stars and he wrote down that Sirius was red in color. Now it's quite curious, could this have been the last stage of the red giant phase less than 2000 years ago? Seems unlikely. We think it would have been a hundred million years ago that uh, Sirius was going through the red giant phase. But perhaps this was when the uh, last remains of the outflow from the star, the creating the planetary nebula, would have been seen. Maybe there was a glowing gas or smoke ring around it as the uh, atmosphere of the star was driven away for the last time. There's another curious thing about Sirius, and that is the legend of the Dogon people of West Africa. The story goes that the, this uh, ancient tribe had tribal stories and knowledge that they passed on verbally from generation to generation and they refer to the existence of Sirius B and even to its 50 year orbit. This was a real mystery. How did these people possibly know about this before the actual discovery of it much later? Well, we think that it might have been passed to them, as it says on the screen here, there was a French astronomical expedition arrived to observe an a total eclipse of the sun in 1893 so maybe that's where the stories originated but we're still not quite sure now i thought i'd have a go at trying to observe sirius b with my telescope i've always wondered how difficult it would be the problem is that it's very very close to sirius a in the sky it's only between 3 and 11 arc seconds away now an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute, which is a 60th of a degree. And so you can imagine that uh, this is really a very tiny angle on the sky. And the resolution of typical amateur telescopes might just about be around three arc seconds because the uh, limitations of the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere would uh, get, present such a limit. And the real problem then is with it so close and with the 10,000 to 1 brightness ratio, it could be quite difficult. But a few years ago now, in 2016, I decided that it was worth having a go. And with the help of a, another friend from the Cambridge Astronomical Association, Paul Leyland, we used my new 14 inch uh, reflecting telescope and a deep sky imager camera on it to try and do this. And here's the results that we got. So on the left, we have an image. Now you've got the somewhat overexposed central image of Sirius A, but just sneaking in on the left there is the little tiny image of the pup. And we can see that uh, the uh, data on the right has been carved out of that. Paul Leyland did this and split out the uh, brightness from the central point of Sirius and turned it into a graph. So you can see that the central point was scoring about 30,000 on the brightness scale up from the camera. And then it died away more or less in a bell shaped curve. But there was a lump on the side, if you sliced it in the correct direction, caused by the light from Sirius B. And we're just picking that up on the edge there. As a little extra hump and indeed that's an a, a angular separation of around about six or seven arc seconds away from the central point of uh, Sirius A. Now this was a real challenge to capture we had to make the exposure times very very short indeed each each digital frame that we were capturing was just five milliseconds long and the uh, we captured many many thousands of frames and then took the best 700 and tried to combine them to make this one image 
So it was a real challenge. So anyway, that's the story of how we tracked down the, uh, the pup, Sirius B, the white dwarf star. And uh, it was a, a very interesting and challenging project. So thanks very much. Do have a look at my other videos on YouTube. And uh, if you like them, click subscribe and you'll find out when there are new ones being posted. Thank you.